Benito Mussolini, he was an Italian politician, a journalist, known as being the inventor of fascism, and he was the prime minister of Italy from 1922 to 1943. He was eventually executed on uh, April 26. That was during the Italian Civil War uh, in 1945 that took place. Now, the corpses of Mussolini, along with four others, including his mistress, Claretta Pavacci, they were hung upside down from a gas station in Milan, Italy. That took place on April 29th, 1945. Now, as dictator and founder of fascism, Mussolini inspired far-right totalitarian rulers such as Adolf Hitler and others. Now, that same uh, dictator, Benito Mussolini, he once met with um, the Roman Catholic Pope Pius the 11th. In his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Pope and Mussolini, David Kurtzer deals with the secret history of Pope Pius XI and the rise of fascism in Europe. Now, in that book, Mr. Kurtzer talks about a meeting between uh, Benito Mussolini and Pope Pius XI, and that took place on February uh, 11, 1932. So that was 12 years before the death of Mussolini. So I'm going to quote now, uh, give you some uh, passages from that book by Mr. David Kurtzer. Uh, so let's get into it. It says, the historic meeting generated worldwide press coverage. Pope and Duce, that's the word they use for the dictator. Uh, Pope and Duce clasp hands in friendship pack, read the Chicago Daily Tribune headline. The front page New York Times headline uh, declared Pope and Mussolini show warm feeling in Vatican meeting. I'll give you a screenshot of the Times there. But the best description we have of their encounter the only time the two men would ever meet comes from Mussolini himself, who wrote an account by hand to send to the king. The pope invited him to sit, asking how his daughter Ida was doing in Shanghai, where her husband was serving as Italian consul. After a minimum of such pleasantries, Pius brought up the subject he thought most pressing, Protestant proselytizing. He told a surprise Mussolini, who was not expecting this to be at the top of his agenda for the meeting, is making progress in almost all of Italy's dioceses. As shown in a study that I had the bishops do, the Protestants are becoming ever bolder, and they speak of missions they want to organize in Italy. Mussolini pointed out that only 135,000 Protestants lived in Italy, 37,000 of them foreigners, a mere speck amid 42 million Catholics. The Pope acknowledged that the Protestants were few, but argued that the threat was nonetheless great. He handed the Duce a lengthy report on the question. Over the next years, he would bombard the dictator with requests to keep the Protestants in check. Wow. Now, first of all, I want you to know, folks, you, you, you never find the Lord Jesus Christ working hand in hand with the political leaders of the world, uh, you know, when he uh, was in this world, when he walked this earth. You don't find his disciples doing that, his followers. So he, so you see the mixture, folks? You, you have this person, this pope, uh, uh, of this political world religious system known as Rom Roman Catholicism, dealing with this leader who happened to be the fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini. He's asking Mussolini to keep the Protestants in check. My, oh my. So do you see, you see here, folks, you know, in this modern day, with all the talk of unity, look, look what took place here between the Roman Catholic Pope Pius XI and and the Italian dictator uh, Benito Mussolini. Let me continue quoting from that book by David Kurtzer. Mussolini should not have been surprised that Pius wanted his help in combating the Protestant threat. In the wake of the Concordat, the Pope had been unhappy about the new instructions the government had put out specifying how non-Catholic religions were to be treated. I told the head of the government, recalled the nuncio, now the nuncio is a papal ambassador sent 
from uh, the Vatican uh, to government leaders and such. So this nuncio who brought Mussolini the Pope's complaint that the desire to equate the Catholic religion with Protestant cults, which are parasites that live by damaging the true religion, was not only entirely unjust, but offensive to us. The following year, 1931, the Pope sent his nuncio, that's the papal ambassador, back to renew his pleas. Protestant propaganda, he told Mussolini, posed the greatest danger the country faced. The government had to act more aggressively against it. In trying to get the government to repress the Protestants, the Pope Look for arguments he thought would appeal to Mussolini. None seemed more promising than the claim that loyalty to the Catholic Church and to the fascist regime were one and the same. Protestantism, the Pope insisted, was anti-Italian, a foreign force that posed as much a danger to Mussolini as it did to the Church. Catholic Action members were ever on the lookout for signs of Protestant activity. In a typical case in May 1931, the Catholic Action heads in one central Italian town wrote to Mussolini denouncing a man who was distributing Protestant literature there. They asked the Duce to ensure that Protestant propaganda be forbidden in any form. For his part, Mussolini was reluctant to break up Protestant meetings and confiscate their literature. In November 1932, when the Pope once again sent his nuncio to demand action, the Duce cut him off. It's better not to exaggerate, replied the impatient dictator. The campaign was making a bad impression on leaders in Protestant countries. He added they were appalled by the Vatican newspaper's hysterical anti-Protestant screeds. Undaunted, a few months later, the Pope repeated his conviction that Italy's Protestants were the greatest cross he had to bear. On hearing this from the nuncio, Mussolini again pointed out few Protestants resided in Italy. Again, this made no impression on the Pope. My, oh my, absolutely mind-boggling stuff that we are uh, reading there, folks. So, you know, listen to some of the things that the Pope and, and, and what he had his ambassadors say when they would send him uh, the request to do something. He, he said, keep the Protestant in check. Spoke about the Protestant cults. Described them as parasites. My, oh my, damaging the true religion, which they believe is the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Protestant propaganda Listen, he told Mussolini posed the greatest danger the country faced. Protestantism, the Pope insisted, was anti-Italian. My, oh my. And then he went on to say Italy's Protestants were the greatest cross he had to bear. Now, now, now think about this, folks. You know, I, I bring this up a lot. Unity. Does this guy sound like he wants unity with, 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 with the true gospel of Jesus Christ? So, so we learned a lot there, folks, and, and, and let me say something to you. The, the teachings of Rome today are exactly the same as they were in the time of this uh, Pope Pius XI, in the time of uh, Benito Mussolini and his reign as the leader in uh, Italy. So, uh, you know, that's something you have to keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they, they believe they rule, you know, there was a papal encyclical that was put out in 1302 by Pope Boniface. Uh, and, and listen listen to what that, uh, uh, that uh, papal encyclical said, one God, one faith, one spiritual authority, unum sanctum. That was the title of that uh, papal encyclical. And at the end of that encyclical, listen to what it says here. It says, furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff, meaning the Pope. I'll read that again, just so you don't think this is uh, some wacko thing here. 
Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Folks, that's Roman Catholic teaching that, that applies for today. Folks, uh, d d don't, don't be fooled. You know, this is why I do these videos. Don't be fooled by what you hear when you have this call uh, for unity, folks. I speak once again as a former uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, they're telling us here that, that it's necessary for salvation that I, because I'm a human creature, be subject to the Roman pontiff. But you see, this is where the word of God comes in, folks. This is where the truth will set you free. And this is what set me free. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible tells me this in Romans chapter 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Glory to God. I get excited when I read things like that, folks. So, uh, you, you, it, whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ, this is how salvation comes, folks, has nothing to do with the Roman pontiff. You see, the Roman pontiff, that's a worldly system. Think about this, folks. That's a horizontal salvation. Has nothing to do with the true gospel. You see, when a person connects with God, it's a vertical connection. It's from you here on earth, you're connecting with the Lord who's in heaven above. Glory to God. That's how you get saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy is available to those who would call upon them. You can be saved. You call upon the Lord. And let me say something. That is exactly what those Protestants were doing in the time of Pope Pius the Eleventh. You see, this is what happens, folks. When the gospel goes forth, people get saved. And let me tell you something, that Pope knew it. He was hearing reports about missions being started. The, the, the gospel was advancing. This is what took place uh, during the time of the Reformation. That Pope knew full well what the gospel was doing. He knew full well that they were coming against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And this is why he bombarded Benito Mussolini over and over and over and over. He would not take no for an answer. As much as Mr. Mussolini would try to tell him that the, that the Protestants were few, the Pope would not have it. He would Keep sending his ambassadors to him. Do something about the Protestants. Do something because the gospel was going forth with power. Ultimately, folks, this is Satan at, Satan at work trying to stop the word of God that will never stop until the Lord Jesus Christ uh, makes his return. You know, Satan is a very crafty spiritual being. Don't, don't, don't mock this, folks. It's real. You are battling against principalities and powers of darkness. The devil does not play games with you. So, we're talking about a spiritual darkness that destroys men's souls. Satan absolutely hates. He abhors the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what you uh, saw taking place uh, back there. Let me give you a, a, a passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, spoken, uh, written by the uh, Apostle Paul. This man was previously deceived. He was a, a persecutor of Christians. Many Christians were killed as a result also. This is what he wrote. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in 
Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. My, oh, my. Listen to what uh, Paul is uh, talking about there. He's talking about his own fellow Jewish uh, people uh, who, who would not receive Christ. And they did everything that they could in their power to stop that gospel uh, from going forth. And, you know, after Paul got saved, listen how he describes this. He says, they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. They persecuted us. They please not God. They are contrary to all men. And they forbid us from speaking to the Gentiles. Listen, that they might be saved. Folks, you know, Satan has a lot of tricks in his toolbox. Deception and distraction are two of our main tools that he uses. He will do anything he can to stop the gospel from going forth. And that's why uh, Paul spoke about that. He says they, they were forbidding them from preaching the gospel to the Gentiles that they might be saved. You see, when the word goes forth, folks, there's power in the word of God. We're sowing the seed of the word. It's the scriptures. And Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. So Satan will do all he can to obstruct and stop that come up with all sorts of things. I call it the devil's wine. That's what it is. And sometimes the more people it gets, the more the more uh, he'll, he'll try to stop the gospel from going forth, folks. And um, this is what took place in the, in, uh, in the time of Pope Pius XI. It's taken place, actually, when, whenever a Christian goes forth to preach the, the gospel, there, there will always be resistance uh, somewhere. You may, you, you may, sometimes you, you may not find it as much as at other times, but trust me, if you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is bound to be opposition. So uh, that's what took place. Uh, you know, as I said, I'm a former Roman Catholic, uh, and it was clearly the word of God that brought me out of deception into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually understood. So, you know, this, this applies to anybody who's ever been saved. You know, it's the Spirit of God that opens your eyes. It's the Spirit of the living God that, that shows you that, that, that the Word of God is true, that Jesus Christ is real, you see. So the natural man, now this was me before I got saved, moseying along in life, on my way to hell, uh, uh, like the, the majority of people in the world. But, but you know, when, when I heard the word, you know, uh, th there's a process that takes place, and the Lord opens your eyes, ladies and gentlemen, and it's the spirit of the living God uh, that shows you these things. This is, it says here that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You see, you see when, when, you're, when the spirit of God anoints the word, you, you say, oh, my. You know, look at this. The Bible says that I'm justified. When I put my faith in the Lord, I'm justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, so so in my own case, you go through these man-made traditions. You know, you go into your Catholic mass, you know, praying my rosary and lighting candles and bowing before statues. And then all of a sudden, you start reading the Word of God, and, and the Word of God speaks out against this stuff. And you're like, what? So, 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 so then you start saying, well, what, 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 what have I gotten myself into here? And then the Lord opens the eyes, glory to God, born again of the Spirit, 1989, folks. That's why I'm, 
I'm telling you, folks. And you know what happens when a person's saved, folks? When you're born again of the Spirit, you can't hold it in. Because now it's the love of Christ. It's the Spirit of God. And you, and, and you, and you have a concern for, for your fellow man because you realize they're in the same predicament that you are in. You know they're lost. Now, obviously, sometimes you try to tell them that they don't go over too well. And this is where the pride of their own heart will keep them in darkness. And unfortunately, many remain in darkness until they die, and they die in their sins, ultimately end up in hell, folks. That's, that's a fact. And this is why I preach the, the Word of God. So, uh, folks, you know, as I said, the Word of God opens your eyes. They're telling you they need, that you need the Roman pontiff, the Pope for salvation. But when you go to the Scriptures in Matthew 23, 9, Jesus said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Glory to God. Whose word are you going to believe? Will you believe the word of Jesus Christ, who created all things, who died and rose to the dead, ascended into heaven? Or will you take the word of man, take the, the word of a pope, a Roman pontiff? I, I choose to believe uh, the, the truth, and this is the truth that set me free. Glory uh, to God. And trust me, folks, the present Pope Francis, he knows that scripture very well. <laughs> uh, you can rest assured. So, um, you know, so it's not only, we're living in a day, folks, when not only Roman Catholics are calling them Holy Father. You've you got, you got so many Protestants and evangelicals who have been seduced. You know, when, when you think about it, it's getting downright uh, scary. So, you know, as I said, you know, the truth set me free. When I, when I was born again, folks, I knew the Roman Catholic priesthood was totally unbiblical. I mean, I mean, here I am getting, I'm, I'm born again, and I'm saved, I understand the cross, I, the, the Spirit of God, you, you're born again of the Spirit. You knew, I, did, did, I, I was in a deceptive religious system. Uh, absolutely, I knew the, the, the priesthood, the, the, the price has been paid already. And I, I've said this before, you know, growing up, uh, the, 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 the Baltimore Catechism, you know, the, the sacrifice of the Mass, this is what you're taught, you know, in their Catechism, uh, it says here, what is the Mass? It says the Mass is the sacrifice of the new law in which Christ, through the ministry of the priest, that's the Catholic priest, offers himself to God in an unbloody manner under the appearances of bread and wine. Now think about that. Uh, I know that the price has been paid in full, but here uh, they're teaching me as a young man that it's, uh, it's through the ministry of the priest. And he's offering himself in an unbloody manner. And folks, the, the, the price has been paid. Uh, you, you don't offer Christ again and again and again. He, he, he defeated uh, death. Uh, one of the purposes of the Catholic Mass, which I've shared many times, uh, listen to this, it's uh, item here, number four, uh, on page 173 of that catechism. It says, one of the purposes is to satisfy the justice of God for the sins committed against him. What? That's heresy. So, so whenever the priest says a mass in this unbiblical uh, priesthood, they believe that the justice of God is being satisfied when he does that uh, mass, folks. It's called the sacrifice of the mass. But if you're a Christian, you know the price has been paid. Christ paid the price in full. So that is the deception of uh, deceptions, ladies and gentlemen. That's like making uh, car payments, uh, endless payments on a car or a home loan, and, and you keep paying them, but they're never paid off. <laughs> Think about that. You, you know, you pay a car, you, you have a three-year loan, four or five, whatever it is, you, th th there's an end to it, but, 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 but the Catholic mass, folks, th this, this thing keeps going. And they, they even pray for the dead people. People are dead already. And that, that's, you know, they believe in a place called purgatory. So they have masses, the sacrifice of the mass, uh, for dead people. So people will make a donation, get a mass card, and, and pray for Uncle Charlie or Aunt Bernadette who died 15 years ago, and, and they're praying for, to get them out of purgatory. And, and purgatory is another lie. The place does not exist. It has never existed. Jesus preached heaven, and he preached hell. He preached salvation, and he preached a damnation. Once again, one of my favorite uh, passages of Scripture uh, Romans 5, uh, verses 6 to 10. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died 
for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, or perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Glory to God. Uh, you know, I read these uh, passages in, in my uh, video messages uh, pretty frequently, and I do that for a reason, folks, it's because there's so much power in what is being said here. You know, folks, you want to talk about the love of God and the fact that uh, you're a sinner. And, you know, when I was saved, folks, when I was truly born again of the Spirit, it, 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 was, it, was, it was like a shock to my whole spiritual system. You know, I, I could not believe how long I was deceived. The first 36 years of my life, and I, you know, you start thinking back of all the times you could have died or you could have uh, lost your life. And you say, I, I know I would have died in my sins. There's no question about it. I would have gone to hell. So, so when you see the mercy of God and you're like, I was so blown away. I said, you did that for me? It's like the Lord waited. And, 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 you, and you look at the mercy of God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That, that I am now, folks, justified in the sight of a holy, righteous God. I, am, uh, uh, I deserve nothing but hell. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the song Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That would apply to any sinner. Any person who's been truly born again will say the same thing, that they deserve nothing but hell. You see, that, that, that's how you know a, a person, they're going to preach Christ and they're going to say, hey man, I know it's the cross, I know it's the blood that, 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 he's, that he died for me. I'm justified by his blood. And the scripture tells me here that I'm saved from wrath through him. You see, you see the greatness, the awesome greatness of Jesus Christ, the person of Christ? He did this because he loved us. And it says also in that passage that I've been reconciled to God. I'm at peace now. God is, God is at peace with me. I was formerly an enemy of his, an enmity with God, but it says now because of what Christ has done that I'm reconciled back to God. How? By the death of his son. Totally awesome, folks, with what Christ has uh, done. So that's the beauty of of, of salvation, folks. I, I know I don't need a, a Catholic priest. I don't need a pope. I, I, I don't need to receive uh, that, uh, that wafer that they say that is now Jesus Christ in, in that wafer host. Oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> folks, it's not true. So, so I know that I am right with God, and it's through uh, faith. You know, many people don't know about the Roman Catholic Council of Trent, uh, that was basically a response to the Protestant Reformation uh, several hundred years ago. And um, in, in that uh, Council of Trent, there are over 100 anathemas or curses uh, instituted against people who do not believe what they believe. And that would include their teachings like on, on the Mass, on purgatory, on, on their tradition being equal uh, to the scriptures and so on and so forth. Uh, it's it's totally mind-boggling. People, most people don't realize that, folks. Um, another thing that uh, you know, as, as I came out of this religious system, you know, one of the big things, you know, because it's a, the, the uh, Church of Rome is filled with idols, and, you know, graven images loaded with it. It's just something you accept. You know, as a Roman Catholic, because you're, you know, growing up, I wasn't a Bible reader. You go to church, you, 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 you just listen to the priest and the, and the readings and so on. You learn from the catechism, but I, I wasn't a Bible reader back then. Uh, so uh, li listen to this, folks, regarding graven images uh, for people who I know I've shared this before, but just in case you, you, you're new here. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath 
or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So that's some pretty powerful stuff. Keep in mind, that was the Lord Almighty, God Almighty, given the Ten Commandments uh, that time. Uh, to Moses, you know, and, and you know, growing up, and I never really knew that uh, scripture. So in the, in the catechism, folks, believe it or not, that second commandment, as I just read it, is not there. You know, as growing up, you know, I, I used to recite the Ten Commandments. And, and the second commandment in the catechism, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You say, what happened to the other? How, how could this be? You know, uh, uh, folks... Uh, it was taken out. So um, you see, you say, so you say, wait, that would leave only nine commandments. So you know what they did, folks? They took the tenth commandment, which dealt with covetousness. You can find that in Exodus uh, chapter twenty and verse uh, seventeen, and uh, they chopped it into two, and they made the ninth and tenth. So, so in the Catholic Catechism. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Now, the, the scripture uh, that deals with covetousness, as I said, was found in uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. In fact, let me see if I can uh, just uh, get, get that one uh, for you here, and I'll, I'll read it to you. So, so that scripture, folks, Exodus twenty seventeen it says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor. So one verse, one verse, Exodus twenty seventeen, and what, what the Church of Rome did, they made two commandments out of it. You see? And that made up for the one that you don't see there. You know, that's why when you stroll through a Roman Catholic church, folks, look to the right, look to the left, you'll usually see statues. Uh, on the walls or whatever, you'll see them in the front, loaded with idolatry, and, and God speaks out against that thing. So things like this, folks, these are the things you see, and you have a choice to make. You're reading the scriptures, and, and so you see the contradiction between the truth which is found in the Bible, in the Word of God, and you see the man-made traditions of Rome. And this is, this is, this is all of this played a great part as, as the Lord was opening my eyes, and I knew this is, this is a, uh, Time to get out, and and that's exactly uh, what what I did, what my wife did. So, uh, <clears throat> as I said before, the Council of Trent with those curses, that was basically their response to the Protestant uh, Reformation, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, it was no surprise that Pope Pius XI requested help from the dictator Mussolini uh, to quench the Protestant movement during his time. So it's a battle, folks. It's a battle. Uh, it's a battle for souls. It, it, it's, it, it's the true gospel versus the counterfeit gospel of Rome. So I'm going to leave you with some good scriptures here, folks. Don't forget these. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Listen to this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. John three sixteen to 18, spoken by the King of Kings himself, spoken by Jesus Christ, spoken by the one who would lay down his life for people like me and you listen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Folks, 
That's Jesus talking about everlasting life. He didn't send Jesus, God, the Father didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn you or me. He sent him into the world that we might be saved. Glory to God. The opportunities there for, for you today, listener, if you've never been born again. Oh, yes, it is. Listen to this. 1 John 5, 9. To 12. This is written by John, uh, one of the disciples who walked with Jesus uh, for over three years when he was in this world. Listen, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. My oh my. Folks, don't ever forget that passage of scripture. It makes it clear. If you don't believe the record or the testimony that God gave of his son, you make him a liar. And it lets us know, folks, eternal life is found in one place. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ. Nowhere else. Eternal life is in the son. Not in Mary, not in Allah, not in Buddha, not in Mohammed. You see, it's found in Jesus Christ alone. You have the Son, if you've been saved, you've been born again of the Spirit, oh yes. You have the witness in yourself. When you're born again, it says here, you have the witness in yourself, folks. So eternal life is found in one place. It's in the Son. If you're not in the Son, folks, you're still dead in your sins. It's very serious. Well, I mean, what can be more serious than that? Than knowing as you listen to me preach here, you're still lost and dead in your sins. And so that's why I'm preaching to you today, my friend, man or woman, young or old, doesn't matter, that you need the eternal life that is found in Jesus Christ. John 3.36, written by the same man, the disciple of Christ, John, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Once again, if you don't know the Lord, if you've never been saved, never been born again, you've never been justified by his blood, hear me. No matter who you are, famous, non-famous, does not make a difference. I'm here to tell you, the wrath of God is abiding on you. You could die right now. I mean, especially the day we're living in, ladies and gentlemen, with this plague going around, this COVID-19. My, oh my. If you don't know the Lord, the wrath of God is upon you. This is what the scriptures say. Now, I know that people mock the word, they don't, but, but, but it doesn't matter. The word of God still stands true. Let me end it with this. These words were spoken by Jesus Christ after he was killed on the cross. Okay? But then he rose again from the dead. Glory to God. He said this to his followers after he rose from the dead. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You see the dichotomy of Scripture? How clear Jesus was? He didn't play games. You believe, you're saved. You don't believe, you will be damned. You see, do you, can you find purgatory in there? Absolutely not. Can you, can you, can you find go to a Catholic master to try to save un, Uncle Charlie? No, you don't find that there. You believe in the Lord, you, you, you turn to him for salvation, you recognize you're lost, you'll be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So that's the word uh, that, that I have for you today, folks. Uh, you, you, heard this, you heard the truth here, and I encourage you uh, to call upon the Lord. God is merciful no matter who you are, no matter what your past. Sometimes people think uh, that they've done so many things uh, in the past or they've even sinned against the light of God. Listen to me. God is merciful. He's the father of tender mercies. And he wants to save you, folks. Oh, yes, he does. So, so I'm going to leave it there once again. 
Be blessed in the Lord.